welcome back to another week of Bible Study Fellowship. We're taking a look at Elisha, the prophet, in 2 Kings 4, 5, and the beginning of 6. Let me open us in prayer, and we'll go ahead and get started. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have given us uh, great examples of what it is that your kingdom will look like. Uh, we have the examples from the Old Testament of Elijah and Elisha. Lord, we also have examples from the New Testament as Jesus taught your people the kingdom of heaven is like using parables and miracles. As we come to your word tonight, Father, I pray that we would begin to understand more about this unseen yet coming kingdom. Amen. So I think one of the things that I've learned uh, over the years is that the hardest working people out there are babies, infants. When infants are just born, they have all the sensory input that is brand new to them. And in relatively short time, they figure out not only how to understand what that input means, but also how to put it to work and to be able to walk and crawl and eat and do all these things in you know 12 months worth of time. So hardest working people out there are babies. One of the things that babies begin to figure out, it takes them about three months. It's called object permanence. So object permanence is the idea that when I can no longer actively see something, I have the, the knowledge that it still exists. So whether it's a person or a toy or an animal, uh, babies don't really have that sense of object permanence until they're about three months old. So if you're around a newborn that's under three months old, as soon as the baby can't see something any longer, they have no idea that it exists. So like a favorite toy or a favorite stuffed animal or even like a favorite person, if the baby can't see that thing within its field of view, the baby's like, no, I got nothing. There's I, that ball. No, it's just gone. And uh, it, it takes a while for us to figure out as people that uh, the things that we see are, are real, that, they, that they're real things. And even though I don't see all of you right now, I know that you're out there. I know that uh, my children are here or I know that there's, uh, my car is out in the driveway even though I can't see it. And we really depend upon our sense of sight to navigate us through life. Uh, probably many of you have said at some point or another, I'll believe it when I see it. And so sometimes people will make claims and, and will respond with a phrase like that. I know I've said it. And I think that we face challenges as people when we're trying to respond to things that are not seen but yet demand that we respond to them. I think a great example that we've all been through in the last three or four years is coronavirus. It's this unseen reality. We can't see it with our eyes. And okay, maybe if we get our scanning electron microscope out, we can see it. But we can't see it with our eyes. But we struggle with how to respond to it. What do we do to this unseen menace that exists in our, in our society? Do we wear masks? Do we get vaccinated? Do we wash our hands? Do we spend more time outside? Do we buy an air filter? Do we work from home? What do we do to deal with the unseen reality of coronavirus? And there's been huge debates in our society as to what is the right thing to do to deal with this unseen thing that impacts us as people. And I think as we look back to Elisha, as we think about Elisha in the Old Testament, you know, he wasn't super worried about the unseen viruses and bacteria that were impacting the people of Israel. But yet Elisha was trying to help the people of Israel respond to an even greater reality than the coronavirus. And that's namely, what is the right response? How do we respond as a nation and as individuals in that nation to the unseen yet very real God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob? And I think that was the challenge that Elisha, Elisha faced, is how to make this unseen but hugely important uh, reality known to people who were very, very visual to people who have figured out object permanence. So I think our main truth as we look at these miracles of Elisha is that God's kingdom is coming. It is real and we need to prepare for it. But the problem is, is that right now with our eyes, God's kingdom is not visible to us. And how is it that we're supposed to prepare for something that we cannot see how do we get ready? How do we prepare our hearts and our lives and our minds for this unseen kingdom 
that is coming. Well, one of the ways that we're going to do that is that we're going to look at God's word. Uh, God's word is going to prepare us for the things that God is bringing to pass. And uh, the miracles that Elijah worked, there's seven of them, depending upon how you count them. You can maybe even go to eight. Uh, But there are seven miracles that the author of Kings has grouped together for us. And, you know, uh, a couple of things to keep in mind with these miracles is that, one, we have no idea how many miracles Elisha performed in his ministry. Was it just the ones that we have here or was it others? We don't know. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we do know, or at least we can, we can extrapolate, is that miracles do not impact every single person that was in need. Uh, every single widow who faced financial destitution uh, because of creditors did not experience a miracle in the same way that, you know, the woman that we're going to learn about tonight did. Uh, But the miracles that we do have, these miracles that are remembered, are definitely included by the author of Kings intentionally. They're not really a random collection of miracles that Elisha did, but they're, they're they're put in here for us to think about Uh, in a way that is intentional. So the author selected them. And the other thing to remind ourselves is that Elisha is not the one who's making these things come to pass. Uh, In the same way that last week when Elisha called out a curse on the kids near Bethel, uh, it wasn't that Elisha was in control of the bears. Elisha was not the one who made the oil flow for the widow. Elisha was not the one who brought about the birth of the Shunammite woman's son or resurrected him from the dead. Elisha was involved, but God is the one who is ultimately working the miracles. I think as we look at the miracles, one of the things that we have to grapple with is what is the author's point of including them? Uh, They're intentionally included, but I don't think that the point for us to learn is that when somebody dies that we know that we should stretch ourselves out on them the way that Elisha did on the Shunammite widow's, uh, the Shunammite woman's son. Uh, there's a different reality. There's a different truth that we are supposed to glean from these miracles and apply to our lives. We're not trying to mirror the things that Elisha does, but we're meant to think about these miracles and evaluate what does it mean, what does it, what does it teach us about God, about ourselves. Uh, And I think that if we think about these miracles in a certain sense, they remind me a lot of some of the parables that Jesus told. Jesus told parables that often began, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like. And I think in a certain sense, what Elisha wants us to see through these enacted parables is that the kingdom of heaven is like a poor widow. The kingdom of heaven is like a Shunammite woman. The kingdom of heaven is like a Syrian with leprosy. Uh, There's a truth that's here that we can learn about what does it look like to be citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And it also tells us about who, what is it that God, the king, is like. And so I think as we look through some of these, that's the goal tonight is to understand more about who God is and what he wants us to learn from the miracles. Don't just stop at the miracle. The miracle is amazing and we're meant to see it and understand it but there's more that we're going to do. And so as we go through these miracles tonight, I'm going to try to focus on those things. I'm going to look at the problem. I'm going to look at the sign, the miracle itself. We're going to look at what can we learn about God from the miracle. And then finally, what is the application that we should, what is one application that we could draw from this miracle for our lives today? And I promise you it will never be stretch yourself out on somebody who's recently died and and uh, call upon the Lord through prayer to bring them back. Um, so there'll be different things that we're going to, to learn and see uh, from these applications. So let's go ahead and get started. We're in First Kings, I'm sorry, Second Kings chapter 4. We're going to look at uh, five miracles that were directed towards the people of Israel. Uh, oil for the widow, the Shunammite woman, and the birth of her son. Uh, the third one is the Shunammite woman and the resurrection of her son. Uh, the uh, the deadly stew and bread miracles. And then finally, we're going to pull from chapter 6, the axe head, uh, to look at miracles that were performed for the people of Israel. There's a series of miracles or things that, that, that Elisha is going to do that are more directed towards the nation of Syria. We're going to start on that tonight with Naaman, but we're going to see more about miracles that are directed at the people of Syria, or at least people outside of the kingdom of Israel, next week as we continue our study 
uh, in Second uh, Kings. Let's go ahead and look at oil for the widow. So this is in First Kings 4, 1 through 7. The problem is, is that there was a family that feared the Lord, and this family was going to be ripped apart due to the death of the father, who was one of the sons of the prophets uh, from 4, verse 1. This notion of uh, selling yourself or selling your children into slavery to pay debt was a customary practice at this time. Not necessarily a good one, but it was a way that you know you couldn't declare bankruptcy in the ancient world. This notion of becoming a slave or an indentured servant until your debt was repaid was the method that you would uh, work out of debt. And so the sign that occurs to uh, that that, Eli- that Elisha brings about with this woman is there's a miraculous provision where one flask of oil is able to fill many containers of oil. This was a private miracle. The only people that knew that it had been worked were Elisha, the poor widow, and her sons. Uh, it's a little bit like the miracle at the wedding of Cana. It reminds us a little bit of Elijah uh, and the and the the flour and oil that continue to be available to make bread. But I think that one of the things that we can learn uh, about God from this miracle is that God's resources are not limited in the way that our resources are. Uh, this woman felt like she had nothing. She had nothing to offer, nothing that she could do to change her situation. Uh, and even though her resources were meager, God was able to come in and reveal that his resources to solve this problem are unlimited. He has unlimited resources. One of the applications that we can draw from this is that God has the ability to work with our nothing but. Her response when Elisha asked her, what do you have in your house? She said, I have nothing but a flask of oil. Uh, and sometimes in my own life, I, I, I say to the Lord or I say in my prayers, I'm like, Lord, I have nothing but the shirt on my back or I have nothing but $5 in my pocket or I have, you know, I have nothing but whatever. We often have, we feel like we're in a position where we have nothing but. And friends, those are the times when God is able to then show us what he can accomplish uh, with his unlimited resources when we feel vastly limited uh, and under-resourced to be able to work with God. Uh, The next miracle that we're going to look at is uh, chapter 4, verses 8 through 17. It is the birth of a son to a Shunammite Shunammite woman. Uh, This woman had been taking care. There there wasn't really a problem, necessarily. She had been caring for Elisha. She had been providing food. She had been providing him a place to stay. And potentially the problem in her life was that she was married to an older man and had no child. Uh, Even when interrogated by Elisha, the woman indicates that she has no problem. Uh, She is wealthy. She is a woman of means. She is living with her people. Uh, And she says, "I, I don't need anything. Uh, It was pretty obvious to Gehazi what the problem was, is that you have no son. And so that's presented as a a problem to Elisha, and Elisha speaks to the woman, and he says that uh, a son will be provided to you in about one year's time. I think the thing that's so encouraging for this one is that uh, the thing that we learn about that, that, so the sign is the woman's going to have a son within the next year, and the thing we learn about God is that God can provide for our needs right? God can provide for our needs. But I think more than that is that even the needs or the desires that we have long since given up on, uh, the things that we have basically said, that is never going to happen to me, that, that chain of events is never going to occur, my life is going to continue the way that it always has. And that thing that I at one point in my life desired, whether it was a child or whether it was marriage or whether it was education, whatever it was, we've kind of let that go. And we've said it's never going to happen. Uh, and in this situation, God brought about uh, that, that desire of that woman's heart in a miraculous way. Uh, and I think that that's one of the things that we can grapple with is like, what is the desire that you have that you've sort of given up on and you think it's not ever going to happen? Uh, Is it possible that God might work uh, in your place of despair uh, to bring about his glory in your good? We then see uh, in verses 18 through 37 that the son that the Shunammite woman received miraculously from the Lord dies unexpectedly. Uh, We don't have a lot of the details other than he wasn't feeling well and maybe four or five hours later the son was dead, died in his mother's arms. And uh, the woman goes straight to Elisha. And says, 
this terrible thing has happened. Uh, and it does seem like Elisha has, has been kept in the loop on some things over the course of time that the Lord has often revealed to Elisha what is happening, what is going to be going on to prepare him for what he's going to face. Uh, and Elisha indicates that he had no idea uh, that this was going on. And so it catches him off guard. We, 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 Elijah is sort of caught off guard after the woman has traveled 20 miles from Shunem to Mount Carmel. And uh, Elijah has an immediate plan. He sends Gehazi back and says, go, take my, take my staff, take my cloak, go and, and, and see if you can you know, bring about a, a, a miracle and bring in the child back. Uh, the woman wants Elisha to come himself. And so we see him go back. We see uh, Elisha pray and really personally involve himself in the resurrection. Again, he spreads himself out over the child, uh, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hand. He's laying on him. Um, and God brings uh, life back into that child through Elisha's intervention. And so really the thing we can learn about God is that God has the ability to restore life. God is the author of life. God controls life. Uh, and perhaps the application that we could think of from this one is, you know, we all have places in our life where we feel that uh, failure and death and defeat reign. And what would it look like if God were to breathe life into those places, places in our hearts, places in our relationships, places in our lives? What would it look like for God to bring life uh, into those places where we feel nothing but death, failure, and defeat? As we go on in the passage, verses 38 through 44, we read that there's a famine in the land. Uh, Elijah is in the region of Gilgal, and again, these, this group, the sons of the prophets, had come to him for a meal. Food was probably scarce, and uh, this, was a, this was going to be an event where Elijah was going to provide food uh, for this group of people. And so the pot is set on, and somehow uh, there are some deadly herbs or a deadly squash or a deadly element that's added to the stew. And uh, in order to resolve the problem, Elijah throws flour into the stew, and we can see that death was removed from the pot. In the same episode, there's another miracle uh, that occurs. There was 20 loaves of barley bread for roughly 100 men. Presumably the men had women and families that were with them, and uh, there just doesn't seem to be enough bread. And so the sign that's occurred, that, that's given, is that distribute the bread, all will eat, and there will be some left over. And that, that is, of course, what happens. There's a meal of stew, there's a meal of bread that is miraculously provided during the season of famine. Uh, one of the things that we can learn about God is that God can heal that which is broken. There was something broken about the stew and it needed to be restored. God was able to do it. And also, there's also that same message in here about God's provision. God miraculously provides bread uh, during a season of famine. Uh, one application that we could potentially draw from this is, what is broken in your life that only God could restore? Uh, what might it look like for God to bring about restoration in that situation or event? Finally, uh, the last miracle we're going to talk about to the people of Israel is the axe head. And uh, again, the sons of the prophets, chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, they are clearing a, a parcel of land uh, for them to live in. Uh, they're working on the bank of the Jordan River, and while clearing down trees and brush, one of these sons of the prophets loses a borrowed iron axe head in the Jordan. And the sign that's done here is that uh, Elisha throws a stick in, and then the axe head floats as if it was wood, and it's restored to the man who borrowed it. Uh, one of the things we can learn about God from this is that God can restore what is hopelessly lost. A piece of iron at the bottom of the Jordan River is just not reclaimable uh, in normal means. It, you know, maybe, maybe in scuba or with special equipment, you might be able to get it. But at this time in the nation of Israel, when maybe the Jordan was at flood stage, going into the water to retrieve this would have been, it was impossible. It was hopelessly lost. Uh, but God was able to restore what was hopelessly lost. And if we think of our own lives, application for us is what hopeless situation are you in? What hopeless situation am I in and how might God bring restoration? Uh, I think, you know, we've talked a little bit about applications and, and other things throughout the, the way here, but the principle for this, for this first section, mostly chapter four and a little bit of chapter six, is that God has the ability to heal, 
to provide and to bring life from death for his people. And I think if we think about what does that mean about God's kingdom, I think it means that God's kingdom is going to be characterized by restoration, by abundance, and by life. God's kingdom is going to be characterized by restoration, abundance, and life. We're going to go ahead and move into 2 Kings 5. We're going to look at all this chapter. Which, uh, it's the, the, the story of Naaman the Syrian. Uh, and it, you, you, the, the way the story starts off is that we're told that Naaman is the commander of the army of the king of Syria. And we've had many battles that have been fought already so far in our study of First Second Kings between Israel and Syria. They're also referred to Aram, A-R-A-M. And this is a man who has waged war against the people of Israel. And in fact, he has taken uh, a girl, a young girl from the land of Israel, and he has made her a slave in his home to his wife. And it is from the mouth of this girl that truth, the truth begins. She says uh, truth about God and about Elisha to Naaman. And I'll read this here. It's just, it's amazing, Uh, you know. Uh, They carried off in one of their raids a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. And so this begins uh, Naaman's journey to the king of Israel. Naaman comes uh, to the king. He has a gift with him, and he comes to the king of Israel. We're assuming it's Joram. And he asks to be healed. And the king of Israel is like a little beside himself because he feels like this is a trick. This is some way uh, to bring about poor relations between the two nations by sending your military leader to me and saying, please heal him of leprosy. The king was saying, this is not a thing that we can do. Uh, Elisha hears about it and he says, you know what? Send Naaman to me. Send Naaman to me uh, that he may learn that there is a prophet of God in Israel. And so Naaman comes and Elisha doesn't even see him. He gives him a direction through a messenger and says, go and dip yourself into the Jordan seven times and you will be healed. You'll be restored. Uh, Naaman is outraged. Uh, He had different expectations for what was going to happen with this visit. He felt that you know, there's better rivers, there's better ways to have done this. And, you know, it, he, he leaves outrage. He's going to go back home and he's going to probably get his guys and come back and, you know, ravage the land and steal some more people to be his servants. Uh, but his servants convince him to listen to the words of the prophet. He goes to the Jordan, he obeys the words of Elisha, and he is cleansed. Uh, the first thing that Naaman does is he goes right back to Elisha. This is in verse 15. I want to read the response uh, that Naaman has. It is, it's, it's profound. Um, uh, then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Okay, this is a man whose heart has been changed. Naaman's life, Naaman's heart has been changed. And he comes back to Elisha and he offers him payment. Uh, He had brought wealth with him. He had brought silver. He had brought gold. He had brought clothing. And Elisha refuses uh, to receive any payment. Uh, Elisha says, I will receive none of it. Um, And then what Naaman goes on to say uh, is, you know, when we think about like, what is the correct response when God reveals himself and his power to our people? We need to look at this foreigner who had been healed of leprosy. We're going to look in uh, verse 17. It's a great response. Uh, Naaman says, uh, If not, please let there be given to your servant, Naaman, two mules loads of earth, dirt. For from now on, your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any god but the Lord. What was the problem in the nation of Israel that we've been hearing about week after week is that they were going out and they were worshiping other gods. God had revealed himself to the people of Israel time and time again. If it wasn't in their history, then it was in the, it was in the modern day through the miracles of Elijah, through the miracles of Elisha. God is revealing himself and his power to the people of Israel and they continue to turn away 
from him. But look at Naaman's response. He, he wants to take dirt from the land of Israel back to his land so that he can worship the Lord on the soil that comes from the nation of Israel. He knows that his job is going to bring him into places where he should not go, into the temple or the house of Ramon, which is another name for the house of Baal, who we've been reading a lot about. He knows that his job as a military commander in Syria is going to require him to go into some places where he should not go, but he wants Elisha to know that my heart, Elisha, is fully dedicated to the worship of the Lord. Elisha tells him, go in peace. And it'd be great if the story ended there, but Gehazi wants to deal shrewdly and obtain a reward for himself. And so he goes back, he convinces Naaman to give him a reward. Uh, Elisha is aware of it, and ultimately Gehazi is struck with leprosy as a punishment for his disobedience. Uh, The principle for this section is that God's revelation of himself demands a response. God's revelation of himself demands a response. I've been driving into work for the last several months now that the work from home era has come to a close and uh, a lot of other people are driving in with me and there are times in the morning during the rush hour when there are lots of brake lights and people slowing down their cars in front of me. Maybe you've been in the situation where you're going about 50 and you look up ahead and you can see everybody's coming to a stop. They're slowing way down. They're going to be going like 20. Well, you've got a choice to make. What are you going to do? You're going to change lanes, you're going to put on your brakes, or you're going to do nothing. In those situations on the interstate, failure to respond will have consequences. And uh, as we deal with the revelation of God through his word, through his miracles, through his Holy Spirit, uh, we need to respond. And Naaman has the right response. Uh, One of the other people who were wrestling with how to respond to uh, miracles was the man who was a cripple who was healed at the pool of Bethsaida by Jesus in John chapter, uh, I wrote it down, John chapter 5 verse 14. Uh, Jesus said to him after healing him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. What might have happened to Naaman if he had been healed and just was like, whatever, I'm out of here, back to Baal worship. Uh, There would have been consequences for Naaman, not only in this life, but in the life to come. And I think that we have to evaluate our hearts that way as well. You know, God is revealing himself to us through his word. Uh, God is revealing himself to us through his Holy Spirit. And sometimes we are reluctant to respond. We see the brake lights and we just keep going. Uh, How have you responded or how have you not responded Uh, to God's revelation of himself in your study of his word, his Bible, in BSF this year. The Bible tells us that that God's word is going to accomplish its purposes, the purposes that it's meant to do. And so, as you've been studying the book of 1 and 2 Kings, what have been some things that have been changing? Uh, What are some of the things that have been growing in your heart? What are some of the ways that your life has changed since you began studying his word this year? Well, I think we've learned from coronavirus that responding to the things that are unseen in this world is not easy. Uh, It's hard to do. It's hard to know what to do. It's hard to do it right. It's hard to do it in a way when everybody feels unified. Um, And I think the same challenge is true as people are, are responding to God's kingdom. We've seen some people like Naaman get it right. And we've seen some people like Ahab and others get it wrong. Uh, And so the the goal for you and for me, my friends, is to stay in God's word and continue to wrestle with it and understand what is the right response to this unseen but very real God whose kingdom is coming. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for the reminder this week that your kingdom is coming. Uh, Thank you, Lord, for revealing to us the kind of king you will be and the kind of kingdom you will have. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would prepare us to be members and citizens and subjects uh, of your kingdom. Thank you for Elisha, Lord. Thank you for the example that he has given to us of what it looks like to live a life fully dedicated to you. Lord, I pray that we would not live exactly like Elisha, but Lord, that we would live uh, lives that are fully dedicated to you the same as he was. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week.